uh, welcome everyone to this lunchtime seminar. Uh, I'm Andres, Professor Andres uh, Portgita from University of Queensland in Coffee, uh, part of the Center for Crop Science. Uh, and before we continue with this presentation, uh, I just want to acknowledge the additional owners um, of their and their custodianship and lands on which we meet today. On behalf of the traditional owners, I pay respect to the ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. And today's uh, presentation will go from 12 to 1, and we have uh, Dr. Yan Zhao. Dr. Yan Zhao uh, is going to present today uh, and on, remote, on the application of remote sensing in, in Australian cropping systems. So from 12 to 1, we'll go, continue with his uh, presentation. And for those who are want to ask questions, there's a Q&A button that should be at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please uh, type in your questions there. And at the end of the talk, uh, we'll try to address them and direct them to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Zhao. Um, so today, as I mentioned before, uh, Dr. Yan Zhao, uh, he uh, uh, is part, currently part of, uh, of Coffee uh, inside Center for Crop, Crop Science. And uh, he did his PhD in 2013 uh, in Chinese Academy of Science. Then he moved to Australia. And since then, he has uh, been a visiting research fellow in, in Griffith University. Then he went to a much colder place uh, in Melbourne, down south, University of Mel Mel Melbourne. And um, by 2018, he moved to Brisbane. He'd seen the light, so to speak, and he was uh, looking for, you know, more warmer climate. So he moved to Brisbane and he joined our team here in uh, in uh, in Kwapi. Uh, and Jan has done his PhD uh, on on the understanding the carbon storage and cycle within the free gorgeous reservoir of China. Uh, currently, he's working uh, and, and, and putting all his energy and his research experience into using of Earth observation systems, high resolution, moderate resolution, uh, at plot field and pixel scale across Australia to characterize and understand the impact of climate, uh, crop management, uh, and environment uh, also on, on, on cropping systems in Australia. Uh, Jan, without further ado, uh, uh, you can continue with your presentation. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks, Andres, for your uh, introduction. Um, first, I uh, to acknowledge the traditional owners and uh, uh, their custodianship uh, ship of the lands on which we meet today, and uh, uh, pay my respect to their ancestors and their descendants. And uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Yan Zhao, and uh, I'm here to uh, present some recent accomplishments in the use of remote sensing for uh, Australian cropping systems, which are a um, collective achievement of our research team. And our work harnesses the power of remote sensing to uh, gain insights into crop growth and the productivity, which we see um, is uh, crucial for the advancement of uh, sustainable agriculture uh, practice across Australia. And I, I, and I look forward to sharing with you how this technology is actually shaping the future of agriculture. So um, let's get started. And uh, here is an overview of my uh, talk today. And I'll start with an overview of uh, remote sensing technology before uh, diving into the complexities of the uh, nation's uh, cropping systems, which is the core motivation uh, behind all our studies. And uh, my presentation uh, is uh, structured around three key case studies. And the first uh, case study we are 
uh, revealed um, long-term uh, trends in total cropping size and the seasonality. And the second, we are detailed growth patterns and uh, uh, phenology stages of the, uh, uh, the main crops. And the third uh, case study, we are briefly demonstrate the crop type discrimination at both pixel and, uh, uh, and the field scales. And uh, um, here we delve into the core of remote sensing, which is um, the uh, non-contact detection of objects by uh, harnessing the uh, spectrum extends from the visible to the short and the long wave bands. Um, while our human vision is um, limited to uh, just the vision or the, the visible range, um, uh, providing only a surface level view of the plants or crops, remote sensing uh, actually transcends this limitation, revealing uh, not only the surface, but also the internal structure and uh, the components of the uh, can uh, canopy, uh, including the distribution of biomass and the concentration of uh, chlorophyll, uh, for example. And uh, by tapping into this, uh, the, uh, the full spectrum, uh, remote sensing enables us to uh, discriminate uh, crops from their uh, surroundings with uh, precision. And it also goes further to allow, allow us to ascertain the uh, growth conditions of, crop, uh, of crops, leveraging indicators such as uh, color index in the, uh, in the visible range, the chlorophyll and the structure attributes uh, derived from the um, uh, from the near infrared. And uh, this kind of information uh, gives us insights into crop growth and, uh, um, and its variations. And uh, um, this one um, here is a summary of a recent online survey highlighting the current developments in agricultural studies using Earth observation technologies. And this survey shows that remote sensing has become a, a, a key player by offering us an indispensable source of data for, um, for agricultural analysis. And this technology is um, uh, not only important for, um, for mapping uh, the, crop in, uh, the crop distributions and the use, but also for uh, monitoring crop growth and modeling the, uh, the impacts of climate change on, on, on crops. And the integration of these advanced analytical methods, especially the, uh, with the recent advancement in, in deep learning technologies, um, this, is, this altogether is providing us with a um, more detailed understanding of um, agricultural systems on a, um, uh, uh, on a large scale. And here, um, and here um, is a... In, I mean, in this study, is a um, we are we are trying to using this um, uh, say uh, spatial remote sensing technology to get a better look at uh, at Australia's uh, cropping systems, and the cropping system in uh, in Australia is really important for uh, for Australia's uh, money making, and it takes up a big part of the country, where the weather and the land can be um, can be very different, and the success of uh, crop in Australia uh, is really depends on lots of um, uh, uh, of the situations, like the mix of the uh, right type of uh, crop being planted, the location, uh, the, the locate, uh, the local um, um, climate, and the, uh, in these locations, how the farmers are actually managing the uh, the land, and also uh, we normally we call this the G by E by M uh, principle, and this kind of mix can change a lot from a location to location, and uh, and uh, this is where uh, remote sensing images really come in very handy, and that they help us see where and how the crops are growing all over Australia throughout the seasons. And this information is uh, very useful for um, for making cropping uh, better and uh, keeping it going uh, going strong. And uh, from here, um, I'm going to uh, start with some uh, real life exams to show you how we are using uh, satellite technology to learn about cropping systems in, uh, in Australia. And uh, this first exam is about finding out which parts of the land are being used to grow crops and which parts are, are actually resting. And in this study, we look at the satellite images that show us uh, how crops uh, grow over time, and uh, 
and this helps us to figure out when the cropping season starts and end, and uh, by analyzing um, these patterns of how and when uh, about the crop uh, crops grow, we can tell uh, a lot about uh, uh, the cropping season for um, for different regions. And uh, um, this first case study is uh, targeting uh, at the main cropping regions across the entire Australia and. Uh, these areas stretch across the um, a country's wheat belt region from um, Western Australia, uh, South Australia, Victoria, and all the way up to uh, central Queensland. And for these areas, we used images from uh, Sentinel-2 uh, platform, uh, which provides us with the uh, 10 meter resolution data from uh, 2016 onwards. And then we established the uh, pre-processes to uh, remove any uh, parts of the images that uh, had clouds or shadows, so um, we could get a, um, a a clear look at the crops only. And uh, then we created a series of images that update every five days. And to um, 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 to validate the results uh, from remote sensing images, um, we also collected uh, over uh, 3,000 uh, field survey polygons uh, from growers and uh, uh, private agronomists across Australia. In addition, we had extra shared uh, data uh, from a big farming research project called GRDs in Whiter to uh, validate some of our outputs as well. And uh, the slide here um, summarized the method we used to uh, detect the cropping seasons, as well as the uh, fallow periods using the uh, pre-processed NDVR 10 series from uh, Sentinel-2. In, uh, speci in, in specific, uh, the method entails the application of a, a cloud and the shadow and masking algorithm to ensure the data integrity and followed by a, um, um, a temporal uh, reconstruction of NDVI values at five day intervals to establish a continuous NDVI curve uh, from 2016. And we then develop a detection algorithm for identifying phenological turning points within the NDVI 10 series. This allowing us to uh, deduce the, uh, the presence of um, agricultural activity. And after we detecting all these individual seasons, um, the aggregate of identified growing seasons within this um, uh, study period from 2016 to 2022, is then quantified as crop intensity, and when and when uh, and, and when we focus on um, examining the terminal portion of the NDVI series, we can then inform the the um, the current land use status whether the agric agricultural land is under active cultivation or uh, being remained as fallow. And, and this analysis contributes to the uh, overarching estimation of active agricultural extent for, uh, uh, for the uh, current season. And uh, here we are showing how well our proposed method for identifying cropping seasons from uh, such as images uh, um, matches up with the uh, actual data. And this has been done at both field level and uh, uh, aggregated uh, regional level. Um, first, at the field level, we compared our um, such at results with the over 3,000 surveyed field programs across uh, the whole Australia uh, and also covering uh, multiple seasons. And then the results showed here uh, with more than 90% uh, of accuracies in, in most uh, seasons, both dry and wet. And uh, sec um, uh, secondly, at the um, uh, state level, we aggregate our pixel scale results to 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 uh, to a state uh, to a state scale and compare it with the official agricultural uh, commodity statistics from ABS. And this data set uh, counts the main crops uh, uh, grow in uh, in winter cropping season. And the, the comparison here showed uh, that the uh, such uh, method in this study agrees very well with the official numbers, which means we are uh, confident it's um, working well. And uh, this slide uh, starts showing some outputs from the detection. And the first output here um, um, uh, is the crop intensity map. 
And this map illustrates the, the patterns of crop cultivation frequency across uh, different agriculture uh, regions. And the data, um, which starts from the year of 2016, indicates a higher frequency of planting and harvest, harvesting circles in regions such as Western and South Australia. Meanwhile, we can also see in Queensland and the northern part of uh, New South Wales, these regions are showing uh, relatively less frequent agricultural circles. And on the uh, graphs on the right uh, side of the slide, we have uh, these two demonstration profiles of the crop intensity at two uh, specific locations. For instance, uh, a crop intensity of two indicates um, indicate a, a lower crop a cultivation activity, which can be seen in the uh, very sparse peaks uh, uh, of the graph. While there's an intensity of six is um, indicative of a, of a more uh, continuous uh, continue cropping activity as shown by the regular peaks um, throughout the seasons. And these profiles uh, further support our uh, understanding of our regional agricultural uh, practices. And this slide highlights the, um, um, the dynamic nature of our studies, our capability to provide regular updates on the status of cropland and fallow land across, um, across different regions. And uh, as we can see from the maps here, early on we observed um, um, a quite active uh, planting in some areas of central Queensland, in, in Western Australia, in, 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 in South Australia, Victoria. Uh, while in South Australia, I mean, you know, in South Australia and Victoria, this uh, also in New South Wales, um, um, most of this part uh, remain followed. But as we progressing through the season, there is a observable increment in, in, in planting activities, particularly uh, in, in Southern Australia and uh, um, New South Wales. By August, the agricultural landscape reaches a peak with, uh, with the majority of regions and demonstrating full-scale cropping activity. And uh, these insights have um, attracted lots of industry uh, interest and our, um, this our, uh, up, up, updating these um, uh, um, numbers uh, season by season. And this one has been incorporated into official industry reports. And also uh, to further uh, disseminate our findings, we have compiled all these results into a uh, into a manuscript and the currently submit to the Journal of Remote Sensing of Environment for um, publication for publication. And uh, a and a big advantage of uh, spatial mapping uh, is uh, it allows us to dive deep into specific regions uh, to observe uh, and uh, analyze uh, changes over time with high resolution details. Uh, for example in here these maps are, are showing the um, or provide a, a focused view of the uh, Mauritia in the New South Wales. And then we can see in these maps in June, um, the maps reveal uh, very scattered instances of um, crop cultivation, while by August, um, the landscape transforms um, significantly. And uh, with these maps showing a uh, substantial increase in cultivation uh, activity or cultivated areas approaching a full size uh, cropping uh, activity in August and uh, September. And this uh, summarized table here uh, quantifies this progression as well, showing a reduction uh, in a uh, fallow land from June to October and the cross, uh, corresponding increase in, in, in crop areas uh, peaking um, um, in, in, in uh, September. And uh, um, here uh, is the second part of our case study one. And uh, we dig further into our analysis by uh, characterizing the detected cropping seasons. And this involves defining the five parameters for, for these seasons. Uh, this includes the, uh, the start of the season, um, the, the, um, the end of the season as well, the peak, and the overall, of, um, the overall length of the season and the length of the uh, preceding fallowed period. And this analysis uh, was apply, applied to both the uh, Sentinel-2 uh, and the MODIS image archives. And uh, we use Sentinel-2's uh, 10 meter resolution imagery, which is available since 2016 to many folks on the spatial patterns. Meanwhile, we use the MODIS uh, 250 meters resolution data, which is 
uh, which can be dated back to the year of 2000 to investigate the the, um, the, the long-term trends and the potential uh, driving factors. And, uh, um, and the priority to examine the new outputs from this analysis, uh, we again validated the season features derived from uh, satellite data by comparing them against actual field observations of sowing and the harvest uh, dates. And the recorded uh, sowing and the harvest from the trials in the uh, GRDC in vitro projects is introduced here for the comparison purposes. And uh, as, I see, as we see from the scar plots here, for the start of season and the sowing comparison, um, the analysis demonstrates a strong linear correlation between our uh, derived data and the, uh, and the field record. However, um, while, while we see this strong agreement overall, the detected start of season is deviated from the one-to-one -one line, showing a, about a 30, 30 days uh, estimation error within the linear relationship. And this discrepancy uh, might suggest that our remote, sen remote sensing measure probably won't be able to directly detect the, 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 the exact sowing time. So I, I think this, this limitation is quite understand, uh, understandable though, because um, given that the sowing signals are um, uh, typically very subtle for, um, for, for remote sensing to, 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 to capture, probably until the crop canopy has uh, has grown sufficiently or big enough to reflect the detectable signals to uh, to the uh, uh, at least for the Sentinel two's uh, ten meter resolution pixels, and 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 there, there is a bit, also a better agreement between the end of season feature and the actual harvest as as we see uh, from the scar plot here, and from here. Um, I will quickly go through several maps uh, to showcase the, the results uh, uh, from the season feature detection method. And this, this, this slide here focuses on the identified start, uh, start dates of the 2021 winter cropping season and observed both uh, the national overview and the detailed insights for Western Australia and the Victoria regions. It's quite, up, uh, it's quite um, evident that there is a uh, notable uh, spatial variability across these different regions. For example, in in, in South Australia, uh, in also in Western Australia and Queensland, we we noticed that the cropping season starts relatively early, around May. While in Victoria and the southern regions of New South Wales, the onset of the season appears to be um, a, a slightly delayed, beginning uh, many beginning in June. And I think this uh, special variations underscore the, um, the diverse agricultural conditions and, uh, and the climatic uh, influences uh, across Australia, affecting the, um, the, uh, the timing of, uh, of uh, cropping activities. And uh, uh, this slide illustrates the, the, uh, the special distribution of the peak days uh, detected for the um, 2021 uh, cropping season. And the peak phase is, um, is kind of uh, critical um, because it is corresponding to uh, full canopy development for crops, uh, which, is a uh, which is probably indicative of uh, key phenological stages like uh, maybe flowering or in the crop maturity. Anyway, anyway, from uh, from the, the maps here, it becomes uh, uh, apparent that in South Australia, Western Australia, and Queensland, the the the, the crops tends to uh, reach their peak within a uh, relatively tight time frame. Uh, time frame uh, primarily in the month of um, August. While in Victoria, there is a significant portion of areas where the peak is um, observed later, stretching from um, September to, to, to October. And, and these similar patterns of, of delayed peaks are also observed in the um, northern part of um, New South Wales, which are later uh, later uh, compared to the adjacent fields in, in, in Queensland. And uh, this map sheds some light on the duration of phyllo periods uh, preceding the identified cropping season. And uh, um, this final lens, um, uh, we see offers uh, some insights into uh, cropping practices and uh, and also the land use intensity. 
And from this map, uh, a fallow period of less than say three months is, 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 is generally indicative of uh, double cropping systems. Such practice are uh, only observed in, um, 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 in the, um, to be quite limited in, in a small area in the highlighted region of uh, northern New South Wales for the 2021 winter cropping season. And the over, uh, overview map of Australia uh, is actually many shows of fallow lenses of under six months for the season, suggesting that most fields are cultivated for consecutive winter crop seasons. This pattern, I think, um, signifies a quick turnaround between the harvest and, uh, and, and then sowing, which is a very common practice in regions with, um, uh, with favorable conditions for, for, for winter crops. And well, from the maps, we also see some longer fallow periods. Um, and, and I think these are often associated with the rotational farming practices uh, designed for uh, managing soil conditions. And uh, maybe in some cases, it might also point to um, uh, land tra uh, transitioning into uh, cultivation. And uh, um, now we are turning our focus to the total winter cropping size informed by the long-term records extracted from the 250 modest satellite images uh, dating back to the year uh, 2000. And I want to highlight that today I will mainly focus on the phenomenon reviewed with this uh, long-term records and more analysis uh, about the, uh, the potential driving factors and the driving mechanisms will be explored by introducing extra data sets, um, including climate, environment, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, probably also the marketing dynamics. So anyway, um, despite this, as we can see from the, the graphs here, despite year-to-year -year fluctuations in crop size, which are uh, very likely influenced by a list of uh, factors like um, climate, uh, like rainfall, temperature, and the uh, marketing uh, dynamics, we, ob we do observe some um, interesting trends here. For example, in, in, in Victoria, in Queensland, in, 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 uh, in South, West, uh, South Australia and Western Australia, there is an overall in, in increasing trend in winter cropping size, and which is probably suggesting an um, a, a expansion uh, in agriculture uh, activity or uh, say improvements in cropping intensity within these regions. But in New South Wales, we can see from the graph here, it's actually showing a marginal decline trend. Yeah, we are looking into this later, but the next one, this map sequence here, illustrates the, um, the progression in the detected start of um, season. Uh, the winter crop season in Australia, especially in the um, in, in in the Western Australia in uh, regions, and in 2020, the cropping season commenced mainly in in um, in, in June and July, um, denoted with the green and the light blue colors. But when we move fast forward to 2011, an uh, advancement is noticeable with uh, the season beginning mostly in May to June, and by 2022, the majority of crops starting in uh, in May, showcasing a, um, how to say, um, a, sig uh, a significant uh, trend towards um, earlier season onset over the past two and uh, past two decade, uh, decades. And uh, this slide uh, lies here corroborates the trend we just saw of a uh, early start of season uh, at uh, aggregate state level. And this aggregate data uh, across the states demonstrate a general early onset of a uh, growing season over the years, despite some years, uh, some year to year uh, variabilities. And, uh, and when, when we look into the season lens in this slide, and the overall increasing trend indicate a increase in the length of the growing season across five Australian uh, states over the past two decades as well. And these results, together with the previous one, these results are um, suggesting a, a, a trend of both earlier starts while extended duration of the uh, crop seasons, which, which is very interesting. And, and these changes could be um, due to climate shifts and um, maybe 
the, the introduction of uh, advanced uh, crop varieties. And the further analysis uh, involving like the pig and DVI, the data of pig, and also the fellow lens I mentioned before, in conjunction with some additional data sets, uh, now is underway to, to investigate the underlying causes of this uh, of this interesting trend observed in um, in this um, seasonality. And now uh, we are moving on to the second case study. Um, and in, in, in our second uh, case study today, uh, we focus on the um, discerning uh, crop growth stages using remote sensing technology. And uh, uh, we characterize the growth of crops by, um, by fitting a curve to, to the available remote sensing data. And by analyzing these uh, growth curves, we extract specific features along the curve and then correlate these features with the observed pheno uh, phenological stages of um, crops. And uh, um, uh, for, for the scope of this analysis, we are now narrowing uh, our attention to 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 wheat and the crops, uh, wheat and the barley crops only at this stage. And uh, and this slide summarizes the method applied in our uh, second uh, case study. And uh, here we demonstrate the application of a double logistic model to feed the, the, the daily NDVI data points obtained from the Sentinel-2 uh, satellite data. And from this NDVI 10 series, um, we have extracted nine key feature points, as you can see uh, listed on the right side of the slide here. And the, these points um, uh, are, strateg uh, are strategically uh, selected based on, um, on the assumption that um, significant change, uh, changes within the uh, crop canopy are indicative of uh, transitions between different crop pheno uh, phenological stages. And we plan to validate this model by uh, comparing these feature points against the phenology observations collected uh, from our um, established um, field uh, validation sites across Australia. And this slide here presents a um, a, 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 a glimpse into the validation sites we have set up in Western Australia, in, in, in South Australia, and in um, also in Southeast Queensland, in partnership with um, uh, with local agronomists since uh, the 2021 winter crop season. And at each site, um, major winter crops such as uh, wheat, barley, oats, uh, canola, uh, lentils are sown in, in plots measuring uh, 60 by 60 meter size. And uh, um, these plots are under constant observation with, uh, with uh, fixed cameras uh, capturing the daily growth uh, status. Um, at the same time, we have this uh, have our collaborating uh, agronomists uh, carry out weekly visits uh, to the to the plots and document the uh, phenological stages throughout the um, entire uh, growing season. And, and 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 the data collected from these uh, activities. Uh, serve as a benchmark for um, uh, our comparative uh, analysis here. And uh, here I start the comparison of the curve features uh, with observed phenologies. And this graph here represents the correlation between the derived D2 uh, uh, feature points from our fit to NDVI curves and the observed uh, tailoring stage. And one thing I want to mention here is um, we have standardized the observed tailoring stage across uh, various sites and the seasons, aligning um, these observations to the point where three to four leaves um, ha have developed using the daily photos uh, uh, from the fixed, uh, fixed cameras inside the plots. And the, the, the linear correlation um, here demonstrates a good uh, concordance between the D2 feature and the ground truth of uh, tailoring phenology. And, uh, and also the, um, the proximity of data points to the one-to-one -one line here suggests that the remote sensing method is, is reliably um, capturing the, um, the tailoring stage, providing a, a, um, a, a strong predictive value for, for, for this important growth um, uh, face. And this slide illustrates the um, comparison between the D3 feature point derived from the uh, NDVI curves and the observed uh, stem elongation stage. And the, the 
in, in this scalp plot shows a spread of data points indicating uh, some level of uh, variation. However, there is still a clear uh, linear relationship between the remote sensing data and the uh, actual observed uh, actual observations. And so, um, despite of these variations, the R square and the room square error are still suggesting that the the, the, the model is, act, is actually capturing the general trend of uh, the stem elongation stage. Well, there is still room for improvements if um, provided with more data. Um, there is fundamentally some sound basis for uh, using remote sensing uh, approach to estimate the timing of, um, of um, stem elongation. And uh, this slide pre uh, presents a correlation analysis between the peak phase detected from our NDVI curve and the observed flight leaf stage. And uh, the peak phase is a, um, for crops, is a critical point for, uh, for crop growth, which is indicating the maximum vegetative development and uh, before, the, um, uh, before the reproductive study stage begins. And the scalp plot, here reveals a positive linear relationship between the timing of the NDVI peak and the observation of the flag leaf stage um, with some, again, with some uh, scatter in the data points. Um, but with this uh, R square of uh, 0.55, I think this analysis here, it shows that over about over half of the variations in the observed flag leaf timing can be explained by the NDVI peak and the uh, room mean square error of uh, uh, about 10 days, about 10 days, um, while still uh, uh, significant, this can still indicate a strong predictive capability of, of the remote sensing method. And given that this flag leaf stage is uh, in wheat and ballet is very important for, um, for um, crop management uh, decisions, such as the timing of, um, of um, fungicide application, for example, the data Showed here provide some valuable insights into uh, the, uh, the applicability of MDVI based monitoring uh, for uh, precision agricultural practices. And uh, the slice so here is showcasing the relationship between the curve derived D4 feature and the observed flowering stage in, in, in wheat and uh, um, barley cultivation. And the default feature here on the NDVI curve is actually uh, indicative of a critical post-peak phase, which typically corresponds to the onset of uh, flowering in wheat and barley crops. And uh, from the scar plot here, it displays a robust or strong linear correlation between the NDVI default feature and the recorded timing of flowering with a R square over 0.6. And this indicates that about 60% of the variability in the observed timing of flowering is, is accounted for um, by the D4 phase derived from the NDVI curve. And it is important to, um, I think it, it is important to note the, 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 the flowering stage uh, follows the, um, the flag, the, uh, flag leaf stage, which is also observed in, in, in the progression from peak to the D4 uh, phase in the NDVI curve here. And also in the, the alignment uh, with the one two one um, line, so here suggests that the, the, the detected default uh, feature closely matches the observed flowering times, um, which potentially means this NDVI analysis as a can be a valuable tool for uh, for um, identifying the key phenological stages in um, maybe in cereal uh, crops. And now we move on to the mapping of these stages. And because with this method we have developed, we are now able to map all these key growth stages on a large scale. And the maps showed here is representing the application of this method to our um, survey fields across Victoria. And these maps highlights again the, the substantial variations in, in, in several critical uh, growth stages, for example, the start of season, the peak, and then also the default, uh, the, the default features. And such variations uh, could be, of course, influenced, influenced by a list of factors like the, the climate conditions, the soil types, or even the uh, different farming uh, practices. And, uh, I th and I think the data presented in these maps provide some essential um, um, 
insights for 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 uh, precision agricultural management because the the spatial and the temporal variations of these um, um uh, of these uh, features with this information the farmers and the, the uh, agronomists probably can tailor their management practices such as the um, say the nutrient application and maybe also the irrigation scheduling to 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 optimize the the the, the, the crop performance and uh, uh, yield as well and uh, as we approach the final part of my talk i want to uh, briefly delve into our third case study about the uh, crop type discrimination using remote sensing and this study this study is led by my colleagues dr jia and uh, dr nangwin tim and uh, the study is a um, say a, a cornerstone of our whole research as it pinpoints the precise areas where the, the the proposed method from our first two case studies can be most effectively um, and, and applied. And uh, um, Dr. Tim has been uh, leading the work to develop um, advanced deep learning models capable of um, 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 discriminating among the major winter and the summer crops across Australia at pixel scale. And the beauty on the, upon that uh, Dr. J has engineered a cutting edge pipeline for the linealating the field boundaries. And, uh, and, uh, and we see this, this step is very crucial because it aggregates the pixel level observations to a uh, field, uh, field level, uh, which significantly diminishes the, 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 the uh, signal noises and uh, increase the overall accuracy um, of, the, um, of the results. And uh, see if we can get the link work here. So yeah, as you can see from the the, the platform here, with this established uh, pipeline, we are now able to um the linealize individual fields for 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 each season, and uh, and 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 this is very powerful, and um, because it in, enables us, um to um, carry out our analysis at field scales, which is more, um, more informative for, I think, for um, uh, farm uh, management. As you can see, the, the blue polygons uh, um, coming up in, in the map is showing the uh, detected uh, field polygons for, uh, for the fields. And uh, this info, and uh, all these outputs uh, from uh, either the uh, crop identification and the field uh, boundary uh, the linealization are now integrated uh, into our regional scale cropping analysis. And, uh, um, and I think this integration marks a significant step forward in, 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 in our ab ability to uh, conduct precise um, um, also data-driven agriculture assessments that are, are very uh, important for formed uh, uh, decision-making and uh, um, 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 management planning in, in, in managing the uh, uh, dry cropping system here. So, yeah, back to the back to the slice. Okay. Um. Thank you all for staying um staying engaged. And here is here is just a quick recap. Uh, about the main points um, from our sessions, the first one is about the uh, about the long term dynamics, and um, um, we have seen, this is in the first case study, and we have seen um, these patterns and this trend that help uh, help us uh, getting to get uh, getting a um, how do you say a, a bigger picture of uh, cropping changes in in Australia, and this information is is key to um, um, understand the. The involvement of the Australian um, cropping system in response to the um, um, the changing G by E by M, and the second point is about the scalable phenology mapping, and we saw in the the second case study, and we can now um, map this wheat and barley grasses on a big scale. This means we uh, we can be more precise in um, how we form and potentially saving. Um, um, time and the resources in, in managing the farms. And the third point, uh, the third point is about the deep learning innovations in uh, crop ID and the uh, field boundary. And, uh, and, and our new models here are 
a big step forward in identifying crops and outlining these farm uh, fields. And this 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 outputs will help us make better uh, I think better decisions for um for uh, for each crop and for even for each field. And uh, here comes to the end of my talk and. Um, um, also, I want to uh, take this chance to extend my deepest uh, gratitude to um, our dedicated team members and also our collaborative uh, partners. And uh, all your commitment and uh, support have been the um, uh, cornerstone of our progress. And with, without all this, our, uh, our achievements um, would not have been um, possible. Um, thank, thanks, thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, that, uh, for a very uh, energetic and interesting talk. Uh, thank you for your insights, and specifically how to, you know, uh, how uh, temporal and spatial Earth observation and remote sensing technologies can be used to actually uh, shed some light on 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 the G by E by M in the cropping systems across Australia, and also showcasing uh, the the crop fan project uh, funded by GRDC and some crop vision project, an ARC linkage project, some outputs from that. Um, I'll open now for question and answers. Uh, and uh, as we have already one there, uh, uh, a question, Jan, uh, from Camille. Uh, in the third case study, how does the model differentiate between crop types? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Melia. Yeah, I saw your question and uh, this is a good one. And uh, sorry, I, I, I didn't provide more details about this third uh, case study because this one uh, being led by uh, my colleague, colleagues, uh, Dom and, uh, and Jim. But uh, briefly, I can answer your question um, like this. Uh, in our case study three, uh, we are collecting lots of um, field programs for different crop types across uh, whole Australia uh, for the past uh, four cropping seasons. And uh, with these um, field programs for different crop types, we uh, developed uh, this um, deep learning uh, focused uh, crop type discrimination models. And uh, these models, we are, uh, these models can learn the differences um, or different uh, cropping signals in terms of uh, actual uh, either the timing of uh, the shape of the uh, uh, growth curve or and also the timing of when the, for example, when the crop uh, uh, reaches the the peak and when the season starts in, in, in different uh, different re regions and for different crops. And the, the deep learning model is learning this kind of information and, uh, um, and then using this information to uh, discriminate different crop types in, in, in the area. And the one thing I want to add is uh, because Australia uh, cropping region is a large area and there is a lot of um, variations in terms of uh, this growth curve um, dynamics or um, variations. Uh, for this reason, we didn't uh, train a model that is um, do the crop uh, discrimination for the whole region in, in one run. We divide the whole region into uh, more than, I think, 16 or 18 regions or GRDC production regions. And for, for each region, we, we train an individual um, deep learning model for for the crop types in in in, in that area, and I think this uh, hope hopefully this answered your questions, Camille. Thank you, Jan. Uh, I think Camille, uh, you can also follow up with uh, Dr. Jan afterwards, and he can put you in touch with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Doom. Uh, Adiera, uh, he also asked a similar question. Uh, I think. Uh, it, the main thing there is, I think Jan has answered most of that, but just if so, how do you integrate it with Google Earth Engine platform, yeah? Okay, um, thanks, and here. And uh, uh, yes, I, has, I think I have uh, addressed uh, part of the um, uh, question regarding the deep learning models for crop discrimination. For your second part about the um, implementation of the uh, deep learning models, 
we are now using the Book Earth Engine Colab platform at this stage to um, implement the deep learning models. With the Google Earth Engine uh, platform itself, you won't be able to, uh, it will be very challenging for you to uh, incorporate these uh, deep learning models. But with the Colab, which is a, a Python environment, you can um, uh, introduce your uh, deep, learning deep learning model uh, and uh, then apply it using the uh, cloud resources. That is for sure. And uh, now um, we are now also uh, collaborating with uh, commercial companies to uh, implementing our um, deep learning models uh, using the Amazon, the AWS platform as well, which is very similar. So, yeah. Yep. Thank you, Yan. Um, then, uh, Yu Zhang, question from Yu Zhang. Uh, for the third boundary detection, what kind of segmentation models are you <laughs> using? Okay, yeah, thanks, Hu. And uh, I think we need another uh, coffee science seminar uh, focusing on this topic, probably, because I think Jen um, is uh, developing this uh, um, pipeline, mainly using the uh, Metas, the Facebook's uh, uh, segment anything um, big model. So, yes, that's the model we are using for, uh, for the boundary detection. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ian. I think it's segment anything again as mentioned, uh, but I think we apply it slightly different. We're putting some biophysical rigor and thinking behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, but uh, happy to, you know, maybe that you can, you know, you can actually email Dr. Uh, Jane afterwards. Um, then there's a, no question. Has this level of work been done in Sorghum yet? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Um, we are now in progress with, uh, with these summer crops. Um, this uh, includes the uh, um, identification of these summer crops, um, which include uh, sorghum, uh, sorghum. Uh, also together with other uh, summer crops in, like uh, cotton, uh, rice as well. About the um, phen uh, the the cropping area detection and the phenology analysis, the summer crops are always part of our analysis. Uh, but I didn't uh, talk much uh, in, in my talk today. But of course, yeah, definitely this is uh, this have been included of our, anal our analysis and more will be reviewed either through reports or through uh, publications shortly after. Yes, thank you. Uh uh, any more questions online? Uh, yeah, please feel free. We've got another few minutes yeah, while we're still waiting for people to think and maybe put some more questions. Uh, I'll, yeah, and I'll just ask you about cloud cover. Um, I think you sure. mentioned that. Uh, it's obviously challenging for remote sensing if there are clouds. What, what's your thinking around that in terms of phenology, uh, mapping these future future points you, you showed? Yeah. Um. Yeah, thanks, Andres. Um, yeah, that's really a very um, um, challenging one. And I think and the, the impacts of a uh, 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 cloud cover, and I think this is um, one of the important reasons, not one of the main, but one of the main, uh, the, the important reasons we introduced the curve fitting procedure. And also this is the, uh, this is also the magic of a uh, double logistic model. Um, because according to our um, experiment, it can robustly capture the season patterns if it has uh, data available at the at the main uh, phenology stages, for example, um, around peak, uh, around the start of, se start of season, and also the end of season. Excuse me. However, um, I mean, if it, if there were missing data during these key stages, the fitting procedure will um, the sort of fail. Uh, to capture the actual peaks uh, or uh, or even the start and end of season, but we won't be able to know where the actual peaks uh, anyway because we don't have any data uh, for the, for those periods. And of, 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 and of course, with this situation, situation uh, there will be some um, increased uncertainty in in in, in getting the um, the stages uh, from remote sensing, and this probably also contributes to the likely outliers, say, in our uh, curve feature comparison with the, um, uh, with the field phenology observation. Um, but I think 
still with 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 this um uh, limitation of uh from from the available data, we can still see the um overall uh, capability of remote sensing in capture the the general uh pattern of uh growth curve crop growth curve or cycle and uh, getting the phenology uh stages um with some uncertainties for 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 application purposes. Yep. Thank you, Jan. I think also another thing which you haven't mentioned is that looking at uh, S1 data, uh, the SAR data from Sentinel. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Because yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. Yeah, right. So clouds. Yeah. So, but it's very computational. But yeah, the same approach can be applied to that. Yeah. Uh, and I think you guys have started to look at that at some of these validation sites, which is important. Yeah. Um, if there's no more further questions, looks like that. Uh, I think uh, if it's okay with everyone, uh, we can yeah, uh, we can call it a day, and uh, the end of the talk. And well done uh, again to Yan, uh, Dr. Yan Zhao, uh, very critical part of our team here in remote sensing here in University of Queensland. And I would remind everyone the next seminar is on Tuesday, the fourteenth of November. Uh, it is titled uh, "Water Soluble Vitamins: New Insights from Novel Analytical Methods." and will be presented by Professor Michael Ratchik, 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 uh from the TUM uh, Technik University of Munich uh, in Germany. Uh, and then closing, you know, uh, to close, uh, the next one is the, you know, if you are interested in receiving the coffee seminar updates, please register your name, uh, email the committee if you want to present. Uh, there's a committee email, coffee science seminar, uh, you can go to the website uh, and also seminar committee coordinator, Professor Craig Hardner, email him directly. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, and uh, thank you for attending and uh, have a good day. Have a good Melbourne Cup. Thank you, Ian.